chapter 10. No changes at this number 10, though. No. Uh, unlike the constant <laughs> changes at the other number 10. Oh, Political joke for those in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Check, don't, I was going to say, check out our politics, but don't. Don't. No. Barely understand them myself. Um, how has your last week been? What's new in your life? I spent a day last Thursday with Surfing England, oh, the I national think... governing body, with skateboarding coaches, snow sports, cycling, netball, rugby, hockey, football. Oh, there must be someone else in the room. I can't remember. Uh, sailing. Um, just talking about coaches and what you know how i love those conversations because you know i asked the head coach for the england surfing team what what's the difference between good and great what does kelly slater look at that we wouldn't which spiraled into this brilliant conversation about external focus of attention and detail on waves that they're looking for that show the point of where the break is whereas like you and me are thinking about where our arms are and why are they up here? That's not going to help. Stay on the board. Stay yeah. on the board. <laughs> and hanging on. But, yeah. but that richness of conversations that then makes you think, mm, okay, well, what's the external focus of attention that I'm thinking about at different moments? And so, yeah, it was nice, nice day. Oh my gosh. There's so much there already. Okay. Stay on that for a second. Uh, how do they, you know, well, we know, how do they get to the point where they can, freely analyze the wave and know that that's the optimum time that's the skill i think there's a lot of um uh, so they're at this center in bristol called the wave and at the wave it's kind of like a two-part thing with a concrete bit down the middle and they can create 13 13 or 26 different types of wave oh. okay so the wave in lanzarote is very different to the wave in uh hawaii yeah okay. because some might be uh shorter and flatter some might be shorter flatter and faster some might be bigger and and slower so they can create all of these different points of wave so they can then start to play around with that they, they can't totally randomize it because of the nature of the technology in the machine but um they're able to then create different waves that then help people start to recognize Ah oh, right, okay. Well, that one breaks here, but this type of wave breaks here, and therefore we need to be here if we're in order to be able to do what we want to do. But the, wow. the, just the detail of that and the movement of the water. Um, although my question, we <laughs> just kind of the kind of thing that I ask. We got all the way through lots of talk of detail coaching stuff. What do you what do you think the kind of question I asked? At that I can point? only imagine. I'm smiling already. <laughs> Um, so a question I, I was trying to think of there, well, how does that relate to other sports? But that's probably too serious, knowing you. What 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 did you ask? Go on, tell me. I asked, do you help people identify the different types of shape of shark in the water? <laughs> because that's the kind of stuff I would want to like, okay, that's a black reef, a black tip reef shark. That's not gonna bite me. Okay, this is, is a great bite. Yeah. That will. I, I mean, want to know it's that. A, it's a good question. And it is a thing when I, in my minimal amount of time spent surfing, um, and more of a bodyboarder, um, when I go out further, even though I'm a competent swimmer, I still go, hmm? and that could be in Ireland where zero sharks in the southeast of Ireland have been spotted. I'm still like, it's coming. What's over there? Is that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question. I, I retract, <laughs> retract my laugh. Apparently they don't. No, apparently they don't. Okay. No. Yeah just yeah chill out really and probably relax and but they do have surfing competitions cancelled because a great white has been seen in the area and they drag everyone in oh wow mm. but the nature of a surfing competition and i didn't understand the sport uh but it's really interesting so you have heats so it's me versus you um and i think it's like your best score from three waves so but you have a priority order in certain events mm -hmm. so you get this situation where it, it might be your priority but i i might go oh that's a really good wave i'm allowed to get on it 
But if you then go, oh, that's a good one, you can get on it and I have to get off because it's your priority, right? Wow, okay. But I might go, hmm, I'm going to pretend to get on that one. So Jen thinks that it's a good one. You get on it, it's a load of rubbish. I nip off and go, ha ha, trick you. Oh um, Poke around get, the water. <laughs> you get this real tactical element to it as well as it's a 1v wave type sport. But yeah, some really kind of interesting different bits that go on like that. But you also have this real peer support competition because coaching is relatively new in the sport and which would be really interesting if you took coaching out of many sports wouldn't it but there's lots of we'd be out together right just talking sharing ideas about what you're doing how you're trying it what you, like that just doesn't happen in many other sports even uh, because it's two competitors fascinating i did mm-hmm. um i did have the experience where oh, a couple of summers ago den and devon And there was two young boys having that conversation about, you know, catching this wave, you know, you go, I'll go, or well done, and feedback from the last one. I felt this, and I thought, as young as they were, I thought, wow, look at this. You know, what other sports does this happen? Or do we, um, in more kind of structured or more traditional sports, do we encrouch their space so much that they can't problem solve? Um, we as the coach feel we need to impart all our knowledge in that quick space you know what's the what's the answer to this or how do you feel like if you think about what you were talking about with the different types of waves what if we just transfer that to passes how often yeah. do you give you know a young person or anybody a chance to figure out what way is the best touch I need here to create space or you know whatever it is um, mm. you're trying to do so yeah I love that nice reminder nice reminder yeah it was um it was interesting and i think sports the sports that are relatively blinkered to their own world i think would benefit from those kind of spaces as we've talked about before i think yeah and what's been happening with you oh my goodness what has been happening with me um we're doing a tiny bit of work with um british canoeing and one of the disciplines is in the area of surf but they're all in the water but just amazing to explore i haven't physically gone to an environment yet so just been great conversations um but we're doing well on the grass football world showing yeah. resilience and on the front foot and as we went to the stadium the other night to the men's game and a couple of our players were interviewed and it was nice to hear a captain talking about uh, team cohesion um, as the priority of you know i guess underpinning everything we do so that was really interesting we did have a conversation during the weekend. I'm wondering if I can loop it back around to you about representative learning design and um, how that might look on the pitch and in other people's environment. W- w- explain where you are with, maybe for our listeners, what it is, because I know it's super important. It's, it's an essential part to develop understanding. That's that's what I know. Um, but... Have you heard anything recently that would be worth sharing and how can we explore this briefly so I can um, share some of the insights that we went through as well this week? Yeah, cool. So before we get into that, explain what your understanding of representative learning design means, because I read a tweet earlier on today, right, by a guy who is so clever and he's in a very high, important role in a sport. I read his tweet and I went three quarters of the words in this I don't understand. Oh, and it's not accessible. It happens. Oh, it happens. It just annoys me. And I really like him as a person, but it's just... <laughs> you're on my list now. You're on my list. I have to pick but, that up. And it might be because I'm just a bit thick. So no. um, uh, <laughs> what does what does representative learning design mean to you? Yeah, good question. So it's designing practice that the tasks within the session or the activities, try to stay word away from the word drills, they reflect the performance what the sport is asking of the individuals um, or the competitive environment that they're going into. Um, now, on a real, like, simplistic way, if uh, when we were talking about this, probably 2012, I worked with a team that were going to play in a stadium of 80,000 people and they'd never done that before. So what kind of things could we do in our practice design to recreate some of that? And that's a, um, maybe, a, I don't know if holistic is the wor- right word to use there, but it's it's trying to find a way that the environment and the tasks 
the tasks and the activities are representative of what the sport is asking of them when they go into competition or what the environment itself might. Does that align with yours or? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's really important that people start to distinguish the difference between training and competition because Mm -hmm. they're two very different environments and there'll be certain bits, like you said, how do you prepare for playing in front of 80,000 people because you can't do that at your training ground. Mm -hmm. So there's some external environmental um social cultural things that all sit around the periphery that probably need some thought in in my world from a football perspective and uh, and i urge you in your sport to kind of reflect this in your own um there's a really nice model that marco sullivan uses where he talks about um four conditions within a football practice that need to be present in order to maximize and provide the most help about the about the learning being representative of the game. Mm-hmm. So he talks about well, you need a ball because that's the game. So that's kind of quite helpful. Um, you need some opponents. So it it has to be opposed in order to um, reflect what goes on in the game. And I'll talk about that in a bit more in a sec. Mm-hmm. Um, you need some direction because the nature of football is you have a goal there and you have a goal there and you attack one and you defend the other. But it generally kind of flows this way, broadly speaking. And you need consequence. So what happens when you lose the ball? So ball is the obvious bit, but if I talk about opponents and I see a lot of practices, certainly with clubs that are in the talent performance pathway, ones that have got lots of equipment, um, where they might be working on a pattern of movement and they just put some solid mannequins in the ground and then you get people moving off the mannequin and pretending to um, create space by moving off the mannequin. Well, mannequins don't defend very well, although I used to get tackled by a lot of mannequins, which probably explains why I wasn't so good. Um, But that opponent... uh, the information that they provide you is really important. So uh, how how are you making a movement away from the ball, which takes the defender with you to come back and get it? And, and what's the timing of that? So how many steps do you need to go to shift the defender's weight before they start moving and then you can come back? Mm-hmm. But what if it's the other way around and I want to come and get the ball to bring the defender with me to either create space behind or to spin off into that space for for me or for someone else. But you can't do that with mannequins. So you're not necessarily picking up all the really helpful, rich bits of information that the defender provides you. So opponents is a really important part. And I, I, I often hear well, we just want to groove this pattern. We want to put this pattern into people's heads. But the game never looks the same because in most sports, people are always moving about, particularly in team sports. And very rarely is everybody in the same position. It just doesn't happen. So you're trying to nail and groove an absolute pattern that's unlikely to happen in the game. Mm -hmm. But what you want to be able to do is do players get the principles of how they move people about in order to create a certain type of movement that might be a little tactical pattern? So rather than go to 4v0, naught mannequins, four attacking players, A to B, B to C, C back to A, who goes to D and then they score, can you just reduce the complexity of the practice and maybe go to 4v2? Or 4v3 if 4v4 is too tricky. Mm. So they might get more repetition in a 4v2 or 4v3, but that repetition is what we talk about with repetition without repetition. So it's lots of similar things happening, but they're different slightly every time. Yeah. And and that's why reducing complexity, not taking opponents away, is a really important thing for me. Mm. So Consequence and direction. So we do a lot of practice in 
practices in certain sports where it's multi-directional when it's just a keep ball practice. But the nature of the game is you're keeping possession for a reason, which is often to move the defenders about, to create space in certain areas to then attack. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a purpose there. But if you've got no consequence, the other team win the ball back, they give it straight back. But what would happen in the game? But if you give the ball back to the opponents, they've got to try and score. So mm -hmm. how do you build in some consequence as well? So those four things for me that I would probably urge coaches to think about in their world, what does all opponents consequence and direction look like because that for me kind of fills that representative learning space that Marcus Solomon talks about. Love that really love that and I think in this I was trying to think of other sports basketball obviously was coming to mind for me based on our experience and just mannequins aren't a thing in in you know sometimes there would be a little bit of a taller the people just stand there like this <laughs> go around me but it was all about feel you know in mm. order for me to perform a skill on a basketball court I had to be able to see feel and hear things you know even the squeak of a runner on the wooden floor to know how far someone was away mm. or the you know the breathing of somebody or the feel of somebody you know right behind me on the left would automatically allow me roll um and then yeah yeah roll to the basket and and roll off them or how I positioned my hand to receive the ball and then how I create space by either either pivoting into them or pivoting away based on their challenge to me you know um yeah so is there a place in training for unopposed practice if we stay on the football space or the invasion space for now so I, I think you just have to be really clear about what you're using it for okay and what the purpose is that you get from it. So if you're thinking about trying to embed something that is um, a decision-making complex dynamic part of the team, then personally, I probably wouldn't go to it mm -hmm. because you're taking too many of those pieces of information away, which is going to inform their decision-making in the game. And, and often you get this, well, let's just make it really simple first. Generally, I don't think you need to because you, you're missing consequence or opponents. So just reduce complexity. Now, people say, well, it's just giving them confidence. But confidence in what? Because what you're doing is you're giving them confidence in repeating a skill that's not going to happen in the game, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily compute for me. But I think if you're, um, if you're coming back from injury and you want to reduce load and it's part of a rehab plan, I can see why something unopposed might be helpful as part of that um, physical maintenance program to get yourself back up to something, right? I can, mm -hmm. or you're managing the load on somebody from a, a safety perspective. I can get that, but the giving them confidence bit doesn't necessarily, in my head, work because it's false. It's false confidence. You're giving them a belief in something that doesn't translate to what you want them to try and achieve. Mm -hmm. It's like. I'm giving them confidence of, right, I can do a 1v1 against a cone. Well, I can dribble around a cone. Ah, hold on. I'm going to give you a better example. Better example. <laughs> oh, no. Are you, did you just right. get yourself onto your soapbox there? <laughs> yes. Right. Rugby. My son. Yeah. Right. Here we go. So, I'm off. Right. So, they've gone into um, under nines rugby which is contact. So they're now teaching tackling. Okay, so now teaching tackling. Um, my son, uh, nervous. Like really, no I don't want to go to rugby anymore. Oh, wow. I don't want to do it. Uh, I don't want to tackle. I don't want to do tackling. Okay, well, let's go and, you know, I, I put him in the boot of the car and we go. <laughs> I was going to say, let's go anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we go to rugby. Uh, the rugby coaches start doing the rugby stuff and I'm there kind of helping and watching. And um, they do it isolated, unopposed. Somebody stands there, one of the other kids. For, uh, well, first of all, they run into something like a map thing, um, which Callum likes, clearly, because it's like just jumping on a crash map. Mm -hmm. um, then they get a kid stood there, stood still, okay? Stood still, no ball. Just stood still. Okay, so we get into this position. We go ring of steel, arms round legs, and then we squeeze. Okay. Um, what do you think the kid does that's being tackled? 
well, they're super compliant and they fall <laughs> over. <laughs> uh, that, of course they do, because they're not moving. Their legs have now been put together. They've got force against mass and, and they fall over. Perfect. You, everyone knows how to tackle, right? Hmm. Brilliant. We go to a festival down at Chichester. One of the other teams, uh, they've got a kid in the under nines who is probably your size. Okay. He's five foot plus. One. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to give me, yeah. So five foot seven, right. something like that. So yeah, yeah. Five it? foot seven. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he's, he's, a, he's, he's this much bigger yeah. than the other kids. Okay. Right. So now think about those two things the information sources that Callum has had, kids standing still. I could just put my arms around them neatly and pull tightly. Now you've got a kid who's got a run up who's running towards an already nervous kid and he's trying to dodge because he doesn't want to get caught, the consequence bit, right? Mm. So he's trying to dodge. The technique that they have taught them is now not working because you've got somebody moving who's really big, who's coming at a different speed to someone stood still not moving. So Callum goes, mm. I tried to tackle him. Well, you did. No. You did. <laughs> But, I, but the isolated, unopposed technique didn't teach him anything that he needed for the real game. Wow. So yeah, I dropped this in to a conversation with one of the coaches who then started to kind of start the conversation. Because actually what we need to do, we need to think about the practice design in a different way. Okay. So what we need to do is, well, what are the pieces of information that the kids need in order to do it? They know the safety bit, because we've talked about that, which is cheek to cheek. So your cheek goes against their bum cheek rather than in front because you'll get your head whacked, right? So they know the safety part of it. So I said, right, well, let's talk about this. What information do they need? Well, they need a kid running towards them, not stood still, because they've got to get some timing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some kids run fast. Some kids are slow. So how do we provide some variability in that so they can start to pick this up? Um, but let's reduce the speed that the kid are moving so they don't come off a ski ramp and they've got a 20 meter run up, right? So let's shorten the distance so they can have a two meter run up. But that kid, what's the consequence? So they need to run past them. So give them a space that they can dodge and evade in, but make it narrow so they're likely to get tackled and they're gonna be within touching distance. So you're now gonna be dealing with a kid who one might go that way and then the next time might go that way. So you've got to adjust and adapt to what your ring of steel looks like based upon what you see in front of you. So reduce the complexity, narrower pitch, shorter run up. They've got a ball, they're trying to score. But what you've done is you've reduced it to enable the kids to get lots of repetition without repetition on a skill that looks more like the real game. Mm. So what we've done is we've done a load of stuff in an isolated practice where the kids stood there complying and falling over in the right way, and it looks nothing like the game. Yeah. Yeah. I told you I was going to get excited by that example. No, it's amazing. I love that. And it's that, it goes back to that false confidence there. The yeah. comment you made about no situations being the same when we look at invasion sports and, you know, um, there's just so much, there's just so much in there. Do you know what it made me think of as you were speaking there? I did come back into the room very quickly, but it made me think about the difference when I'm on a plane of someone says, and if something happens in a case of an emergency, I will drop down from the ceiling and just put your oxygen mask on. I thought, I'd be that cool casual if the plane was rocking upside down inside out to be like oh yes casually take you know <laughs> or when have I ever practiced even putting one of them on fortunately I haven't had to on a plane but um I think in Japanese schools I'd have to look this up properly but I think I remember watching a, a documentary about it in Japanese schools they take the kids to different centers on days out or multiple days out and they do earthquake training Okay. They take them into situations where they actually physically have to react to a situation in the room. Um, completely off topic, but it's that idea of yeah, it's, you know, it's real. It's real. It's real. And and here's the situation. How do we, you react? What is the environment giving you? Um, what does the sport ask of you? What does the situation ask of you? So 
No, loads there, loads there. Lots of uh, reruns, I'd say, for people to get pen to paper. Thanks, Nick. Um, mm -hmm. At Coach Convo, that's where you find us on Twitter. What else? Coachconversation at gmail.com. That's where we're at. We'll see you next week. Is this this end of season finale? finale? Oh, what a way to finish. Episodes. Extended episode. Um, okay, we'll see you soon, soon for another season. Yeah. Woo. Bye. Bye.